Let's go back to Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. And we left off talking the last time on the point number four. What is the decision required by this particular commandment? And if you recall, he tells us in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, we're still on the first commandment. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. And I told you at that time that we had two very specific points to make under this question. This is what we said. We said that, we, number one, we can state this, we can state this, uh, or we can make the decision, we can state the decision positively, okay? So the decision can be stated positively, or number two, the decision can be stated negatively. So now, we had said a number of things the last time, and we said that we can, the decision can be stated positively, and the last time we said on the A, we said we must acknowledge that there is only one living, and there is only one living and true God, and serve him with all our heart, and we also said point B, we must turn to the Lord and be saved, for he alone is God, and then we said on the point number C, we must love the Lord our God, Jehovah God, Yahweh, with all of our hearts. And then we said point number D, we, we must seek to walk before God and be blameless. And we said E, we must sanctify the Lord in our hearts and set him apart as holy and fear him. And then we said but F, we must realize that we cannot serve two masters. We cannot serve God and money alone. And if you recall, this is where we had ended the last time. And we were reading in Matthew in chapter 6, we had said in verse 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So we looked at make, making the decision and stating it positively. So now let's look at number two, that the decision can be stated negatively. The decision can be stated negatively. Remember what we're talking about. We're talking about, you shall have no other gods before me. We must have no other gods whatsoever. We must have no other gods whatsoever. We must never, ever believe in false gods. None whatsoever. That's not a luxury that we have if we've acknowledged that the creator, Jehovah, Yahweh, God, he is the creator and the sustainer of life and it's to him we are beholding. Now, when he tells us you must not have, or you shall have no, or thou shall have no other gods, you shall have no other gods before me. Remember in Deuteronomy, go there with me just briefly in chapter 11, verse 16. Now you recall, I had told you, my purpose is to drive us back into the scripture and allow the, speak, the scripture to speak for itself, allow scripture to interpret scripture itself. We need to grow, to, grow, to grow accustomed to hearing the Word of God once again for ourselves. We must take time to read it, meditate upon it, to chew on it, to feed on it on a regular basis. You cannot get enough of reading the Scriptures for yourself. You cannot get enough of reading the Scriptures silently and out loud and hearing the Word speak to you. He says in Deuteronomy, in chapter 11, verse 16, he says, Beware that your hearts are not deceived and that you do not turn away and serve other gods and worship them. Now, I want you to notice that. Excuse me. I want you to note something. Have you noticed that God's word has to repeat things over and over and over and over again? I mean, does that make us knuckleheads? I mean, think about it. He states things positively, he states things negatively, but he has to repeat it over and over and over again. Even in the New Testament, in, the, in 1 John, in the 1 John chapter 5, turn there briefly, look at what he says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, a small little verse, but it goes straight to the heart of the matter. He says in 1 John 5, 21, he says, Little children, guard yourselves, he says, from what? From idols, from false gods. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment with me. The decision, the decision demanded by God is clear. It's not convoluted. It's not confusing. Okay? It is very clear. We are not to have any other gods, none whatsoever. There is only one true living God, and we're to believe in him and in him alone. 
Why is this concept such a difficult concept to grasp? When you consider all of the education that's available to us today, all the technology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, yet the, the heart of man has not changed. The issue is always a heart issue. That's one of my wife's famous uh, uh, declarations. She's always talking about the issue is a matter of the heart. It's a heart issue. Now, in Genesis, go back there in chapter 15. And he says this in verse 6. In Genesis 15, 6, he says, Then, this is talking about Abraham. Then he believed, he says, in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. He credited it to him as righteousness. Why? Because he believed in him, and God credited him with faith. In 2 Chronicles 20:20, 20, 20, he says this. 2 Chronicles 20:20. 20, 20, they rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, this is what he said, Listen to me, O Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Put what? Your trust in the Lord your God and you will be established. Put your trust in his prophets and succeed. So he tells us that our trust must be in the hands of God if we're to be a blessed people. In John chapter 3, verse 16, that great famous verse that we always quote, he says, for God so loved the world. This is God, the same God we've been talking about all this time, that he gave his only begotten son. Why? Because the whoever, whoever believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Our very existence throughout eternity depends upon this. In that same book of John in chapter 6, he tells us in verse 28 and 29, he says, therefore they said to him, we shall do. He says, what shall we do? What? What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. That you believe in him whom he has sent. And then finally in 1 John chapter 3, verse 23, this is what he says, and it's a commandment. He says, this is his commandment. His. What? That we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one, and love one another just as he commanded us. You, you notice here, it's nothing about touchy-touchy, feely-feely, it's not about your emotions and your sentiments. Not even about your thinking. It's a command. <coughs> now, let's begin to look at this from a different perspective. Okay? And what I want to talk to you about is the biblical consequences of having other gods, of believing in other gods. We know the verse very, very clearly. So the question that we want to attempt to answer here is this one. What are the consequences of breaking this commandment? What are the consequences of breaking this commandment? Because I want you to understand this. The, this passage does not cover the consequences. And the reason is seen for two in the first two verses. It doesn't, but that's the question we need to answer. Now you remember, what is the command? You shall have no other gods before me. Now go back to Exodus chapter 20. Look at the first two commands. Look at the first two verses there. He says, then God spoke all these words, saying, look at what he says. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now, do not forget what we had talked about early in, this, in, in the beginning of this series. God gave his word to Israel, and it was to and through Israel for the whole world. That's us. Okay? So now, here's what I want to drive you at. The motivation, the motivation for keeping the Ten Commandments. What is the motivation? It's not to be fear of the judgment of God. The reason for keeping the commandments is to be the love of God. That's why we keep it. The glorious salvation and deliverance he has provided. So look at what he's saying. In Exodus 20, verse 2, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. 
See, the Israelites were to keep the Ten Commandments because God had delivered them from out of Egypt and out of slavery and out of bondage. Now, make the connection to what we said at the very beginning of this series. God gave his word, the commandments, to and through Israel for the purposes of it reaching the whole world, us, the Gentiles. Remember, Egypt is a picture of the world. And Israel's slavery to Egypt is a picture of man's enslavement to the world, to its bondages of sin and death. But God loves us, and therefore he has provided salvation for us in one person. Who is that? Christ Jesus, our Lord. It is this, the love of God, that is, that is to compel us to keep his commandments. It's not the fear, it's the love of God that is, compels us, and we should desire to keep his commandments. But having said this, there are other reasons for obeying the commandments. Okay? And as mentioned, they are covered in other scriptures. Our purpose in discussing the Ten Commandments is to give an overall discussion, an overall picture. Okay? And for this reason, we're including the consequences of breaking the commandments in a deeper study okay? for each one of these commandments. Right? So now, this is what we're looking at here, in this, and that's what we're going to go into. We're going to go into deeper study number one. It's a little deeper study, and that is the biblical consequences of having other gods and believing in other gods. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to have a, 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 a three-point outline we're going to be looking at. Okay? Here, so that you kind of wrap your head around this. You can hang your head on this. Here's a good way to just kind of mark this out in your heart, in your mind, as you take notes and so forth. Okay? And you can follow this through clearly. Okay? Now, there's are three point reasons, or three point reasons, okay, for the consequences, okay? Now, there are three consequences. But remember, we're asking what are the consequences for breaking this commandment, okay? Well, let's look at it. Number one, there are the consequences upon God himself. And number two, there are the consequences upon oneself, one's day-to-day -day life. And number three, there are consequences of judgment. And we're going to look at this in more detail. So let's look at this first one. There are consequences upon God. And there are three things that I want to discuss with you today. That is, the person who, A, the person who does not follow God cuts the heart of God and causes pain and hurt for him. That's exactly what you're doing when you disobey this first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. And secondly, the person who does not follow God causes the name of God to be blasphemed. And thirdly, the person who does not follow God lives a life that is detestable to God. That's the consequence. So now let's look at these in more detail. Remember, I'm going to go drive us back into the scripture. Turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 18. For chapter 8, I'm sorry. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Look at this. There are the consequences that fall upon God. A, the person who does not follow God cuts the heart of God and causes pain and hurt for him. This is exactly what's taking place here. He says in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, this is what he says. He says, that the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. When you violate this commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, you are personally declaring your rejection of God and God alone. Remember, you have placed another God before him when no other God has sent his son to die for you. In Psalm 81, 11, in Psalm 81, 11, turn there, he says, but my people, this is God talking, but my people did not listen to my voice. And Israel did not obey me. You never want to hear those words pass God's lips about you. And 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, in the New Testament, he says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to what? To a state of repentance. So we looked at this first consequence, okay? We looked at the consequences upon God. We looked at point number A. We looked at the person who does not uh, follow God, cuts the heart of God, okay? You're causing God pain. You're hurting him. Let's look at point number B, and that is that the person who does not follow God causes the name of God to be blasphemed. Do you understand the consequences of that? 
Look at what he says in Romans in chapter 2, in verse 23 and 24. In Romans chapter 2, verse 23 and 24, because I want you to see this. And here Paul addresses the issue, the issue head on, and look what he says. He says, you who boast in the law, through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? Now he's, he's speaking directly to the people of God. And he says, for the name of God is what? Is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Just as it is written. You remember the commandment? You shall not have no other gods. Because of you, his name has been blasphemed among the Gentiles, among the unbelievers. And point C, the person who does not follow God lives a life that is completely, utterly detestable to God himself. It's just that plain and simple. So much for all the good people. All the, goody, all the good people, they're just so nice and they're so moral and they're so religious. Okay? All right, They're so spiritual, but they don't follow God. He says, utterly detestable before me. In the book of Titus, in the New Testament, he says this in chapter 1, verse 16. In Titus 1, 16, he says, They profess to what? To know God. This is what they're professing. Okay? But by their deeds, by their action, by their conduct, by their behavior, they deny him being detestable. That's not my word. This is God's word. Being detestable and disobedient. And look what he says and worthless for any good deed. That's the biblical consequences of breaking this commandment. Now let's look at the second reason. There are consequences upon oneself one day, and one's day, and day to day life, okay? In other words, when you break this commandment, okay, there are consequences to you as well as to your daily walk and your daily life. That's gonna happen. You cannot escape that. There's just no way of escaping this. Okay? So let's look at this overall because what we're going to do is we're going to look at a fairly extensive sub-point outline here so that you can hang your head on it and you can get an idea where we're going to go with this. Okay? Remember what we're talking about. We're talking about what are the consequences or what are the biblical consequences of breaking this commandment. So we looked at number one. We looked at that there are consequences upon God. And now we look at number two. There are consequences upon oneself. Okay? And this affects your daily life. All right? So look at A. The person, point A, the person who does not follow God follows after dumb, lifeless idols, man-made gods that can never help him. That's why he's dumb. B, the person who does not follow God exchanges the glory for the life that does not, that does not profit, a life that is absolutely, utterly worthless. And C, the person who does not follow God, all right, is that experiences a life of emptiness and trouble and missing out on the spiritual rest and peace of God. D, the person who does not follow God lives a life of hopelessness. E, the person who does not follow God lives a life that is enslaved to what? Enslaved to sin. And F, the person who does not follow God lives a hypocritical life, okay? a life that denies the truth, knowing the truth. G, the person who does not follow God defiles his mind and his conscience. And after a while, he develops a seared mind. It doesn't even bother him anymore. And then H, the person who does not follow God experiences the most illogical life that can be lived, a life of a fool. That's what Psalm 14 one says, only a fool will say in his heart, there is no God. And then, J, and, then, and then J, the person who does not follow God, okay, places his faith only in the signs and the wonders. He's always going by experiences and signs and wonders, okay? The person who does not follow God will have no root and fall away when the temptation comes. That's why they fall away. They're scattered, okay? They're, they're, they're parched and scorched. Okay? So I want you to look at this. And then I want you to also look at this. And the person who does not follow God places his faith only in signs and wonders. That's what people, you know. They're looking for signs and wonders. They look at the news and they go, ah, oh. and they got a sign. And, they got, and, then, and it's just amazing to me. And then the person who does not follow God is blinded in his mind, unable to see the saving light of the gospel of Christ. And the person who does not follow God lives a life of ungodly lusts, a life that mocks God and his son and the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the biblical consequences of those, okay? who choose to break this commandment, these are the biblical consequences. We are the author okay, of our problems. It was once said, we met the enemy, and it is us. Okay? We're it. 
Hmm. We can talk about the devil all we want. We can talk about the world all we want. But look in the mirror. You have violated and broken his commandments. So let's begin to look at this in a little bit more detail in the scripture. Look at this with me. Okay. So let's look at point A. The person who does not follow God okay, follows after dumb, lifeless idols, man-made gods that can never help him. In the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 16, verse 20, this is how he places it. He says this, God, he says, can man make gods for himself? Yep, they can. They do it all the time. Yet, they are not gods. Yet, they are not gods. For Africa, you go to Asia, you go to Latin America, and you got all kinds of idols that have been, that, that have been carved out, and people want to sell it to the tourists. You, know, you have all these Christians who go to the tourists, and they want to bring back all these artifacts because they consider it cultural, when in fact they're not cultural, they're spiritual. And yet in the houses, they got all these little mini-gods, okay? So the question that, that Jeremiah is raising here when he says, can man make gods for himself? Yet they are not gods. That's clear. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, he says, you know that when you were pagans, now notice it says, he says, when you were pagans, question, are you still a pagan? You were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. It shouldn't be that way now if, in fact, you were a follower of Jesus Christ, Jehovah God. B, the person who does not follow God exchanges the life of glory for a life that does not profit, a life that is utterly worthless. This is why we have a lot of people who know better and choose not to do better, okay, and are suffering an utterly worthless life. He tells us in Jeremiah, again, the prophet Jeremiah, this is the, the weeping prophet, he says in chapter 2, verse 11, this is how he says it. He says, has a nation changed gods? Think about that. Has an our nation done that? When they were not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. We have literally done that in our country, in our nation, like many other nations around the world. And then look at C. The person who does not follow God experiences a life of emptiness and trouble, missing out on the spiritual rest and the peace of God. They have no rest. They have no peace. They don't have the peace that surpasses all human reasoning, questioning, and understanding. They don't have that. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, the author of this book says it this way. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter into what? to that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. In Psalm 78, he tells us this in verse 32 and 38 and 33. Look at this. In Psalm 78, 32, 33. Look at this. In spite of all this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wonderful works. So he brought their days to an end in futility and their years in sudden terror. My friend, that's exactly where the majority of people are who have violated this commandment. You shall have no other gods. Welcome back. We're looking at the Ten Commandments, and we're specifically studying the first commandment. Turn your Bibles back to Exodus chapter 20, and we're looking at the first three verses. And note that it is God who is speaking. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt at the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, if you recall, the last time we were dealing with the issue of that there are consequences upon oneself that come upon oneself and one's daily life as a result of having violated this commandment. And in our last session, we started to talk about this, and I just want to do a quick review and look at this. We said that what we said was that a person who does not follow God's, uh, 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 who does not follow God, follows after dumb, lifeless idols, man, man-made gods that can never help them. This is exactly what that person is doing. So a person who does not follow God follows after dumb, lifeless idols, man-made gods that can never help them. And if you recall, we looked at the book of Jeremiah, and do not get lost in our theme here. We're looking at the first commandment that you find here in Exodus chapter 20 in verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. And when what we're looking at right now is what other consequences that come upon one's life and their daily walk with him. 
So we're looking at Jeremiah as an example of this. And Jeremiah 16, 20 says, Can man make gods for himself? Yes. Yet they are not gods, obviously. We also said in 1 Corinthians in chapter 12 and verse 2 the following. You know that when you were pagans, which presupposes you no longer are, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Then we said on the point B, we had said that the person who does not follow God exchanges a life of glory. That's the glory of heaven, the glory of the presence of the ever-living God. For a life that does not profit, a life that is absolutely, utterly worthless. Again, Jeremiah puts it in these terms in chapter 2 in verse 11. This is exactly what he says. Has a nation changed gods? Doesn't that sound like our nation? Isn't that what we did when we outlawed God out of the school system, out of the public square? When they were not gods, but by my, he says, but my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. That's exactly the condition that our nation, our country finds itself in, like many other nations around the world. Then we had said on the point C, the person who does not follow God experiences a life of emptiness and trouble, missing out on the spiritual rest and the peace of God. So many have no rest. So many have no peace. They don't have the spiritual rest. They don't have the peace of God whatsoever in their lives. That's the reason why the writer of the book of Hebrews in chapter 4 Look what he says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11. He says, therefore, let us be what? Diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through the following the same example of disobedience. And then in Psalms, it says this. In Psalm chapter 78, we are told in verse 32 and 33. In spite of all this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wonderful works. Doesn't that sound like a lot of people today? So he brought their days to an end in futility and their years in sudden terror. I have neighbors like this. This is how they live. I know people like this. This is how they live. So remember, what are we talking about? We're looking at the consequences of having violated this, this commandment, the first commandment, and what those consequences that are brought upon oneself in their daily walk. And if you recall, in our last session, I had mentioned to you quite a number of these issues. So let's go on to the next one. D, point D. The person who does not follow God lives a life of hopelessness. Hopelessness. Let me tell you something, friend. The worst thing that you can have is hopelessness. You can, achieve, you can, you can be without water. You can be without food. You can be without clothing, you can be without transportation, you can be without finances, you can be without a job, you can be without, be without family, you can be without a lot of things in this world. But the one thing you cannot be without is hope. Hope. Hope is what keeps things in perspective. Hope is in believing in the fact of who God is and what he said and what he has already demonstrated in your life in the past and the, and the grace of God that he's poured into your life in the present adds up to that he is still the same God in the future. So now, the person who does not follow God lives a life of hopelessness or a state of existence. We are told in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 12, the following. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ. Remember that at one time you and I were separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, because that's where we were. We were strangers to the covenant. We were strangers to the, to the, to the covenant that God had made, the agreement that he had made, the vow that he had made, the pact that he had made with the people of Israel. We were excluded completely. At one time we knew nothing of this. And he says, and he says why? Having no hope and without God in the world. Think about it for a moment with me. The worst thing that can happen to anybody is to have to live in this world, in this fallen world, in this sin-filled world, okay, without God. It's inconceivable. I cannot conceive of such a thought. And yet, 
I know it's real because at one time in my life, that's how I lived. In this world, okay, okay, without God having no hope. Point E. The person who does not follow God lives a life that is enslaved and slave to sin. You know, for all the freedom that we enjoy in our society today, most are slaves to sin. You know, in order to become a slave, by and large, you had to have been conquered and forced to become a slave. But we willingly become slaves to sin. We are told in the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 4, and I want you to see this with me. In Galatians chapter 4, look at this when you look at verses 4 and chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. It says, however, at that time, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back again to the weak and the worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved all over again? Have we not all known people? People who come to church for a while and they profess Christ and they go right back to that world. And they're like yo-yos going up and down, up and down. They're in church for six months. They're out of church for the next 18 months. They come back to church for three months and they profess this and they profess that and they make all kinds of vows and promises. And relatively soon after that, they're right back out in the world all over again. That's exactly what Galatians is addressing here. Look at the next point. The person who does not follow God lives a hypocritical life. This is point F. A life that denies the truth. So the person who does not follow God lives a life, uh, lives a hypocritical life, a life that denies the truth. Now, let's look at this. In 2 Timothy, turn your Bible there to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. Now, notice, I'm constantly driving you back into the scriptures, into the scripture. Allow scripture to interpret scripture. Allow the scripture to speak because this is God speaking. This is his voice speaking to the depths and the breadth of your person. He says in 2 Timothy, here in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 5, holding to a form of godliness, don't we all know people like that? Just look around every Sunday. Although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. There's all kinds of people who are religious. They hold to some kind of a form of godliness and piety and sanctity and holiness, which is but a, it's a pretense, hypocritical. We're also told, and I want to take time now, turn there with me to Romans chapter 1, please. Go to Romans chapter 1, because these are the individuals that we find walking on this earth. Now, God in this, that we find in this section that God is speaking through the person of the Apostle Paul, which obviously is being, being carried forth by the person of the Holy Spirit. But look at this in Romans chapter 1 with me. And I want you to note this with me, because this is talking about God's wrath one day will befall, okay, the unrighteous. But he tells us why this is going to happen. So the person who does not follow God's life, God lives a hypocritical life and ultimately is denying the truth. See, to deny the truth is because you know the truth. You've heard the truth. You've comprehended the truth. But it's an outright rejection of that truth. Again, Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 18. Now let's just walk through this in verses 18 all the way to verse 23 together. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who do what? Who suppress the truth in what? In a state of unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them. So people tell you, well, I'm not sure if God exists. I don't believe God exists. They're lying. God has already made himself evident within them, which is why I don't believe in atheism, in atheism or agnosticism. For God made it evident to them. Now, either those individuals who claim to be atheists or agnostics and everything else, Either they're confused or God is confused. Either they're telling the truth or God's telling the truth. But somebody here is lying. Because God tells us here at the end of verse 19, for God made it evident to them. 
For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his internal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through, through that, through what has been made. Why? So that they are without what? Without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became what? Fools. In verse 23, and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. This is exactly the condition of those who deny to follow God, okay? And they wind up in a hypocritical, hypocritical lifestyle. Listen to me. Let's look at the next point. Point G, the person who does not follow God, what does he do? He defiles his mind and his conscience. You ever heard that term, a seared conscience, or no conscience, or a dead conscience? That takes work to get to that point in your life. That really takes hard work. Titus addresses this issue, the book of Titus in chapter 1. And look what he says in verse 5. He says, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. You know, that's one of the reasons why Paul tells us in several times in the book of Romans, he says, there are none who seek after God. There is none who are righteous. None. N-O-N-E. None. Nada. Zero. None. Why? Because they have been defiled. Look at your next point. Point H. The person who does not follow God experiences the most illogical life that can be lived. It's a life of a fool. F-O-O-L, a fool. He tells us in the book of Psalms, in chapter 14, we've heard this verse many times. Let me, let me labor the point and let me bore you once again. In Psalm 14, 1, this is what it says. The fool, he, the fool, she, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. That's a fool. Look at your next point. The person who does not follow God will have no root and will fall away when temptation comes. They, they're constantly being blown by the wind. These are people who live their lives like this, with their finger in the air, blown to which way, which way is the majority of people going? What the culture says to us, what the news media tells to us, tell to us, okay, what the church tells us, and what everybody else tells us. But they never hear to what God says. Look, he tells us, go, go, to, your, go to the New Testament, the book of Luke, and look with me in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. And let's look at specifically verse 12 and 13. Those beside the road are those who have heard... Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. That's the whole purpose of taking the word away from their heart. And then he says in verse 13, those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. We've seen many of that happen in the church. And these have no firm root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation, they fall away. We all know people like that. Look at your next point. Point J, the person who does not follow God places his faith only in signs and wonders. You know people like that? Always looking for signs and wonders and always wondering why they're never sure. Well, I don't know if you know this, but by definition and by nature and by design, signs and wonders are constantly changing. They're never the same. By design. By purpose. Look at this with me. They're constantly placing the entire, the, 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 enti the entire lot of their life on signs and wonders. They're looking for signs and wonders all the time, but they won't look at the Word of God. Look what he tells us. He tells us in John chapter 4. Here we find Jesus speaking in John chapter 4. Look at the end of that chapter in verse 48. John 4, 48. 
And so Jesus said to him, he's having this conversation. He says, unless you people, and this is a condemnation, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. You know people like that? When I see it, I'll believe it. Those are fools. Those are fools. See, because they live by the flesh. They live by eyes whose sight is failing them. They live by that which can be deceived. Those are fools. Look at your next point, point K. The person who does not follow God is blinded in his mind, not only his eyes, but in his mind, unable to see the saving light of the gospel of Christ. And we're told this. This is the reason why you shouldn't be so upset when you're talking to somebody about the gospel and they, they just got this blank look on their face. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Look at this. He says, In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds, he says, of the unbelieving. That's the reason why a lot of them just look at you like you're crazy. Their minds have been blinded. Look what he says. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not, so that they might not see the gospel, the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. They have been blinded by the enemy. Now you need to understand something. They weren't selected randomly by the enemy. Okay? These are people who will willfully place themselves in that position. You need to comprehend that. Look with me. Point L. The last point under this section. The person who does not follow God lives a life of ungodly lusts. A life that mocks God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is exactly how they live. They live their lives this way. Jude had to contend for the faith. And so look at this when Jude is speaking, and this is in verse 18. Jude only has one chapter, so look with me in Jude, verse 18. And notice how Jude states it this way. Remember what we're talking about. We're talking about the consequences that come upon a person's life, and especially on their day-to-day basis, okay, of those who willingly, openly, okay, violated this commandment, the first commandment. You shall not have other gods before me. Remember, that's what we're talking about here. And Jude says this in verse 18. He says, that they were saying to you, in the last time they will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. You don't have to go far to find people like this. You do not have to go far whatsoever. They, they are replete all over the place. In 2 Peter chapter 3, look with me in 2 Peter chapter 3. And I want you to see how the Apostle Peter addresses this issue. And he speaks to us in verse 3, 4, and 5, 2 Peter chapter 3. Look what he says. He says, know this first. He says, know this first of all. That in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Have you heard that? Haven't you heard that before? People are always talking. They're always running at the mouth. You know, yeah, you guys have been talking about Jesus Christ is going to come back, and he never comes back. And they've been saying this for centuries after centuries after centuries after centuries. Okay? Now, he's coming back, and he goes, where is he? Where is he? Oh, God's a good God, so if he's a good God, where is he? And, you know, we, can, we have people who make these statements openly, okay, in a blasphemous way, constantly, and we don't seem to care, and we don't correct them. They have no idea what they're saying. This is the reason why the Apostle Peter is addressing this issue. And he says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3, 4, and 5, Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come. He didn't say they might come. He says they will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. And he says, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, here we go, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Nothing has changed. Nothing will ever change. For when they maintain this, it says in verse 5, it escapes their notice, it escapes their mind, it escapes their intellect, okay? And look what he says, that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of the water and by water. They have forgotten about that. But remember, these are the same people who believe in the Big Bang Theory, right? You know, two seemingly disconnected, discordant, 
molecules. You know, as far as from east, as far as from west, in the heavenlies, ran into each other by accident, and thus here we are. Acts chapter 17. Look what happens here in verse 18. Acts chapter 17, verse 18. And also come of the Epicurean, the Stoic philosophers who were conversing with them, some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others says, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. That's how they look at us today. You know, you guys, you, you, know, you, you talk to people and you have a Bible or you say praise the Lord and they look at you and go, you actually believe in that stuff? I've had that statement made to me numerous times. And then finally, let's close out this section and look at Psalm chapter 73 and let's look at verse 11 and 12. Psalm chapter 73 and let's look at verse 11 and 12. Look at it. They say, how does God know? Hmm. Talk about the arrogance of a statement like this. How does God know? And there is knowledge with the Most High. Behold, these are the what? The wicked and always at ease. They have increased in wealth because they actually rely exclusively with everything that they have depends upon their wealth. But they constantly question, how does God know? Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. How do you know? 